Hi everyone, and thanks for joining our webinar tonight on how to deliver a winning pitch. We're joined today by the University of Aberdeen, Steve Harrison, who will be taking you through some practical techniques to help you design and strengthen any pitch. I'm now going to hand over to Steve, who will begin the webinar. Hi everybody, as uh, Danny just said, I'm an honorary fellow at the uh, University of Aberdeen um, Business School. I've got over 20 years experience in helping to craft and coach others to develop their winning pitches. Previously, I've had a corporate career where I once was successful at uh, a board level pitch for a, a, a billion. And today I work as a project manager for Scottish Enterprise, which is the economic development agency for Scotland. Over the past three years, when I counted it up, I've helped over 100 founders and teams to try and pitch to win. And my, my plan today is to try and share some of that thinking with you. I'm currently, I need to say thank you because I'm actually sitting in the Centre for Entrepreneurship, or as I like to call it, Elevator HQ. And I understand this is going out across six different continents to over 500 people. Thanks for joining. To start with, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about my story. And in doing so, try and show one of the uh, important aspects of the, one of the models that we're going to talk about, which is establishing credibility. So I'm an engineer. And I've engineered various things in very early days in the 1980s. You'll see there I was involved in engineering just planes and cars. And I also had my first pitch in business where I got to say how to save a couple of million pounds with an idea. I got hooked. I've worked for a large multinational for a large part of my corporate career where I had responsibility across a range of different divisions, primarily work in the processing industries. At one time looking after 400 million working capital being part of a team that put together a billion pound strategy, the billion pound acquisition plan, and I've worked across Europe, India, China, and Middle East. Great times. In that time, I've crafted and pitched, I coached others to pitch ideas, but I've also worked with social enterprises, schools, and individuals and charities. In 2007, I came to Scotland, and working with Scottish Enterprise, I now work with small medium enterprises, high tech, high growth companies, biotechs, digital media. I develop bold ideas and I coach others to try to pitch to win. And I spend most of my time in a discussion about should we try to nurture the next unicorn or should we do rabbit farming? Four of the major projects I'm involved in today and they all involve elements of ideas, bold ideas, disruptive ideas, and they all involve entrepreneurs and helping those entrepreneurs to pitch and to be able to win business and to be able to win investment. Digital energy, offshore energy, the digitalization of the oil and gas industries, digital health, seeing where and how data and data driven health, circular economy or the low carbon economy. And overall, large number of projects now that are all to do with the digital economy and how that's transforming uh, the, the country that I live and work in and the globe. Today I'm going to talk to you about three different techniques which have come about because of this practical experience of working with entrepreneurs. What I call the three C's, one of which I'm trying to establish now, which is compelling, credible and confident. I'm going to talk to you about a technique called DAFT, daring, awesome and fabulous thinking, which is a methodology we developed to help people think up and sharpen bolder ideas. And PMI plus, the positives, the minuses, the things that are interesting and the actions you need to take to refine, to strengthen your pitch. And this is a technique I've used with many entrepreneurs and founders to help them to sharpen their pitches and to improve them to win. Today, one of the things we're going to do is we're going to talk about an example of a number of businesses. And one of those businesses to start with is a guy called Eric. And Eric is fed up of stepping in dog mess. And Eric loves drones. And Eric has a bold idea. He thinks maybe he could use drones to eradicate this problem. One of the other things we're going to do is we're going to look at an existing business that many of us will know, which is Airbnb. And we're going to use that to make comparison to some of these tools and techniques and methods and to see how 
the evolution of a story, the evolution of a pitch. So where did Airbnb start? Airbnb started when some people had an idea and they realized this could be quite a big idea. And that idea was about renting airbeds on other people's floors. And they started to realize that actually some people like this and maybe this could be something that was worth exploring further and they could do something with. Over time, they managed to get some funding for that idea. But was the idea as good as they may have thought it was? Paul Graham, the founder of Y Combinator, an investor in early stage entrepreneurial ventures, said that the idea is terrible. But I like the founders because they won't die and they're very imaginative. Eventually, Paul decided to accept them. And Airbnb finally raised that massive $20,000. Later on, we can see they were successful with a further seed round. A few years later, everybody wanted to invest. In my day job at Scottish Enterprise, as I say, I help many people pitch, many people improve ideas and projects, concepts for new ventures. And one such is a company called Data Detect, an actual spin out from University of Aberdeen. And in 2009, there was three scientists and there was one entrepreneur. And we were sitting in a meeting room and we were exploring potentially how was we going to convert and take this idea that was all about natural language generation and be able to actually convert that and build a business around it. And as you can see, by 2014, it floated on the alternative investment market for 100 million. And today it's trading at circa 35 with an employment of about 50 data scientists. When people ask me what my day job is, I often refer to this and say my job is to create jobs by investing in public sector money you know, and help people to be able to create bold business ventures. But I also refer to this, the nooks and the crooks of what was at the heart of data text, which was, Imagine there is a machine offshore and it's gone down and it takes a time. It takes a couple of hours for all these different steps to be taken. But with the engine the data text created, it took one minute for all those same activities to happen. And it was consistently just one minute. And that image helped data text to win business from a number of large oil companies and to be able to get traction and also to start to get investment. But I also have been involved in early stage businesses right from that very first concept. Somebody says, Steve, I have an idea, all the way through to established businesses seeking how they can find new additional ways of growing their revenue or their profit. So back to Eric. Eric's pitch. We are going to build a company that will identify and remove canine excrement through the use of unmanned aerial platforms. Just have a think about that for a moment. We need to raise 10 million to develop this solution. We will now use the three C's to review Eric's pitch and to see how we can strengthen it. So the three C's, credible, confident, and compelling. How credible is Eric's pitch? Does he have the technology to be able to do this? Do you have doubts that he'd be able to do this? How compelling is Eric's pitch? Do you have concerns that maybe there might be other issues about using drones to do this service. Do you think that other customers would actually be willing to do this? Some of you may have thought of privacy and data concerns. And how confident is Eric in this business? How confident are you that Eric would do this? Remember, Paul Graham backed Airbnb because he liked the founders, their tenacity, and their creativity. So yes, I think maybe I'm willing to back Eric and to see where he could take this business. 
Let's go back and look at Airbnb. When Paul invested, the Airbnb story shows essentially they were selling airbeds and they were making money to survive by selling cereal. It didn't seem very credible. It definitely didn't seem very compelling, but they had confidence. As it starts to grow, it starts to become more credible. Then they're making $400 a week. They're starting to prove the model. But was it compelling enough? If it's credible and it's confident, that's good. But is it really enough? If it's not compelling, if you're in that space where you're credible and confident, there's nothing that much to care about. So although we believe that these founders can take this story and we think that they can deliver on it, how far can they take it? How exciting is the opportunity? And we believe we need to use techniques sometimes to help people to be able to improve the nature of how they express their opportunity, to be able to demonstrate and build FOMO, fear of missing out, and encourage people to see that this is something they need to be part of. Let's go back to an earlier part in the story. Although Airbnb was growing, it wasn't enough for Fred Wilson. Fred's words, we focused too much on what they were doing at the time and not enough on what they could do, would do, and did do. Brian, one of the co-founders of Airbnb, we were attempting to raise 150,000 at a one and a half million valuation. You could have bought 10% of Airbnb for that. We got five rejections and two didn't even reply. And here's an example of a rejection. Apologies for the delayed response. We've had a chance to discuss internally and unfortunately don't think that it's the right opportunity for us from an investment perspective. The potential market opportunity did not seem large enough for our required model. In hindsight, do you think they would still think that? So today, Airbnb has proven it's gone from being confident, demonstrated its credibility, and now it's proven that it's a compelling market player. It's a very exciting proposal. We can all see and we all know how this works. Can we learn from that same journey? There's a conflict with investment, with bold ideas. We often find that when we need the money most, we can't excite the investors. And conversely, when we don't need the money most, is the time when the most investors are interested in us. So let's go back to Eric. And we started off by saying Eric was confident. Confident in his belief that he could do something about messy shoes. How can we make this story compelling? How can we make it so it's, we want to care? We need to care. We need to be part of this story. But if it's only compelling, compelling and confident together, we don't believe you're gonna deliver. We're not going to trust you. So we have to be careful because if we are confident and we demonstrate a really compelling idea, you know what will happen? Your idea will be sold to somebody else more credible to deliver it. So we need to ensure that we can establish credibility, your credibility, and do that you need to establish your own credentials. As I did earlier, beginning of this talk, I shared with you my background. I shared with you some of the things I've done. And hopefully I've managed to establish a level that says, listen to Steve, he might know what he's talking about. We can seek others and borrow their credibility. We can have partners. We can share those names. It's also important that we show you do what you say and that you track that progress. Demonstrate to people that you are in control 
and that helps to demonstrate credibility. Now, if Eric was credible and compelling, but not confident, we have a very different problem. If Eric was credible and compelling, it would be a weak delivery. We wouldn't feel as confident in this idea as we potentially do. We would think that maybe he's unlikely to win. And we see this a lot with a lot of technology generated ideas where the clarity doesn't come across in the presentation and instead the hesitancy, maybe a feeling of lack of total enthusiasm, lack of total commitment comes across in the body language. Maybe that all demonstrates to an investor or to others observers that the confidence isn't there. And if they're not confident in themselves, I'm unlikely to be confident in them. Some of the ways to remedy this, build on your own authentic voice and style. It's very easy to listen and watch many TED lectures, many pitches, many online videos, and to try and replicate the same terminology, the same phrasing, the same techniques and methods, but even better, is to find your own authentic voice and to practice and use your own authentic voice and to get really confident in the message that you're delivering to others. People often ask me how long should a pitch be? And I say it depends upon how much time you have with the person. So if you can pitch it in a minute, pitch it in a minute to get a further five. On those further five, pitch it to get an hour. On that hour, pitch it to get a half a day. And by then they're probably brought into your idea. It's also useful to pitch for feedback. Find as many opportunities and ways you can to pitch to people who don't know the technology or the opportunity or the market you're talking about. Help them to help you to be able to help yourself. There's a good technique from the Lean Toolbox and from the Development Toolbox called A-B testing. A-B testing is where you try one idea with one party, you try a different idea with a different party, and you see what works. It's a good technique to help to craft and strengthen a pitch. Try one idea, see if it works. Try a different approach, a different message, see if that works. All of that is about helping you to become more confident in how you deliver. Now, if we recall, Eric's idea wasn't overly compelling. And I suggested a technique called DAFT, Daring, Awesome, Fabulous Thinking. This technique has been developed to help people to think of bolder ideas, to take their idea and to take it further forward, sometimes into the stratosphere. And we'll go through each question and we'll see how it can apply. So D is for daring. How can you make this idea more daring? For whom? In this case, for Eric, how could we get local government to pay for this? Imagine, come to Aberdeen, a city with no dog mess in its parks and streets. Who would be scared by this idea? Well, if you have a dog and you don't pick up, you could get fined and you might get prosecuted. Awesome. Or as my kids say, awesome. Who or what is this idea disrespectful of? People's privacy. The drone could snoop on dog owners who don't clean up who will be singing the praises of this idea in the press, to their communities, to their friends, people with children. No more cleaning up messy shoes. Fabulous. How can you make this idea more fabulous, more delightful, for whom? Imagine if the drone helps the council to find the dog owner as well as to clean up the mess. How could this idea create even more smiles and on whose faces? Imagine if that dog mess was collected and used to generate energy that powers charging points and community Wi-Fi. The T stands for thinking. This is how we can best communicate these thoughts to others via image, metaphor or story. Imagine if we develop a short film or a cartoon showing how the service could work 
and the various benefits it could generate. And to move an idea into action, we always need other people to get on board with the idea. Who do we need most to get on board with this idea? We need city leadership to get excited about it. Now, if I tell you that all those points that we've just been through have been developed in workshops with various entrepreneurs, founders, wannabe entrepreneurs, people in MBA programs, people in established companies, this is a mix of how this exercise has been used. And you can see how simple and how easy this technique is. Daft, daring, awesome, fabulous thinking. So Eric has applied some of daft and here is his revised pitch. Dog mess cost the UK 50 million pound a year to clean up. This is estimated to be a potential fine of more than 100 million pound not being collected currently. We at Drone Cleaners have a patent pending technology to collect the mess, clean the area affected and find the owners of the dogs. What do we think? Has it helped Eric's pitch to move more towards the middle? Is it delivered with more confidence? Does it seem more compelling? Is it more credible? Let's refine it further. Let's sharpen it. The tool we're going to use comes from the father of lateral and creative thinking techniques, Edward de Bono. If you haven't heard of him, I advise you to look him up. He's got loads of techniques and methods, loads of practical experience and loads of practical techniques for you to use yourself. This technique, P stands for positives. The M, the minuses, the I, the interesting points that we haven't thought of or that come to mind when we think about things. And the plus is a reminder that the action that we need to take to overcome the negatives, build upon the positives and connect and make something of the interesting points. I'd like you to reflect and think on Eric's pitch as we've thought about this, or maybe even on your own pitch. What are the positives of the idea and the pitch? What are the strengths that can be built upon? The M is for minus. What are the minuses or the negatives of this idea or pitch? What are the weaker areas we need to address? The I is for interesting. What is interesting about this idea? What other new ideas come to mind? And as we said, the plus is for actions. What actions can be taken to build upon these strengths, address the weaker aspects and progress the idea or pitch? Now we can combine both these models together. And in doing so, we create a matrix. A matrix, as I said, that I've used a number of times with a number of founders. And it helps us to be able to see how we can take a process approach to being able to look at a pitch and identify how best to improve it. As you can see, we look at our three dimensions of compelling and credible and confident. And for each one, we will look and see what the positives, the minuses, what interesting thoughts and what actions can be taken. So for me, one of the positives that comes out that's most compelling about the new pitch is 100 million in the UK alone. It's also patent pending and it seems to have a strong action based words. These are a good platform to build upon. But I have concerns. Privacy could be a large negative, could be difficult to overcome, especially in these times of data and data privacy. There's no mention of the customers who's actually already paying for this already. Might be a good idea, but maybe the business model doesn't work. So I'd like to see something in that space. And well, it's difficult without seeing Eric actually delivering this. It's difficult to see if he's as confident in this as I would like to believe he is. What's interesting, well, as I went through that pitch, I think what could be done with those collected feces? 
What is the value of them? Who wants them? How could they be used? And that's a different technique for a different time called disrupt cliche flipping. Nobody needs the collected feces. Flip that cliche, turn it into money, find a way to do that. And here you'll see we've identified an action. Improve the pitch. Can we take, can we make, can we produce energy from that collected mess? And could that help to be able to change the business model, be able to change the financial structures? If we think about this from a credible perspective, there was no mention of customers. One action we could take is bringing clients and client testimonials. One thought that comes to mind, how to establish more credibility. How does Eric's previous job help with this? What you don't know is that Eric used to work for the local authority and that Eric's role was to look after the streets and the sanitation and ensure that they were kept clean and they were managed effectively. That gives you a different state of credibility to this business compared to if I told you that Eric was a shoemaker or that Eric actually ran a news agency. So we need to be clear how we can establish credibility on the facts that are known and think about where there are gaps in that credibility, how we can find ways to establish that credibility through partners, through connection with others, through activities that we've done. Moving on, the piece for me that needs to be still there, the action and build that confidence is a bold future statement of vision. I get that Eric is going to build, use, use drones, he's going to collect the mess, he's going to clean things up. What's the bold vision? What's the end statement? All of this as examples that have actually come again when this technique has been used with others. And the missing gap there is because people have told me that without seeing Eric pitch, it's difficult to know what else comes out that's about how to make this more confident. So it depends what you imagine. If you imagine Eric was standing there as a bold entrepreneur seeking to build a very disruptive business, very confident in his delivery, you know, and that's, that's how we'll imagine that that's what this is there. So Eric stands to you and he says, dog mess cost the UK 50 million pound a year to clean up. This is estimated to be a potential fine of 100 million not being collected currently. We are working with three local authorities to trial our patent pending technology to collect the mess, to convert it into energy, to clean the area affected and find the owners of the dogs, all through the use of drones. In the future, our vision is no more messy shoes. At the end of this, I hope, like me, you agree that Eric's pitch has moved far closer into that circle, right in the space in the middle. Delivered confidently, with great credibility, and a compelling vision for people to build into and to buy into. I started by saying I was going to explore some tools and some techniques, and I've used those same tools and techniques as we've gone through the presentation. So for the three C's, compelling and credible and confident, I hope that I started by trying to establish my credibility with you. I hope that throughout, I've helped to show a compelling nature of what could be possible for your pitch. How could you make it bolder? How could you transform it, make it braver, make it more daring, awesome or fabulous? Throughout, I've used the same techniques myself. So this pitch has been refined using the P, M and I plus technique with a number of people providing me feedback on the pitches itself, for which I'm very thankful, and for how to explain and how to discuss this to others. But the technique of positives, minuses, interesting and action can help you all to be able to refine and strengthen your pitches so that you could pitch to win. Thanks very much. I'm going to hand back to Danny, and I think we're going to have a Q&A session. Yep, thanks for that, Steve. So we've got a question here from Sarah, who has asked how you know what not to include in a pitch and what to leave in. For me, 
It's a great question. Um, what not to improve is something that could potentially jeopardize one of those three aspects. So if by including it, you jeopardize your credibility or you potentially jeopardize the compelling nature or you potentially uh, jeopardize the confidence that there may be in you, then I would suggest not to include it. I know many other gurus and, and advisors would suggest that you need to be totally open and transparent and say as much as you can. But I think at the early stages when you're pitching, you're basically asking permission to continue a dialogue and a discussion beyond that point. So I think if it's something that's gonna potentially jeopardize, then take it out. If it's something that's gonna enhance, then bring it in. We've got another question here. I think it's something you touched on during the main webinar, Steve, but a few people are asking a similar question about time recommendations or they're concerned that they're going over you know, some maximum length. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. I mean, I'll, I'll just reiterate what I said and I'll, I'll explain a little bit further. So for me, a pitch needs to be based upon the time you have with an individual. So if you have 15 minutes with an individual, don't pitch for the 15 minutes because you want some question time. Pitch for maybe five of those 15 minutes yeah, and design a pitch that's really compelling. Maybe get it so that your pitch can be told in a minute, really, really simply. Eric's pitch, no more messy shoes. We're going to help the world to have no more messy shoes. Would you like to learn how? Let's talk about it. And then you could expand that. So have a pitch prepared that's five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour. You know, it has more detail, but still builds upon those three aspects, credibility, confidence, and compelling nature. Does that answer the question, Danny? Yeah, that's perfect. But someone else who's asked if you have any advice for incorporating storytelling into a pitch. I'm a big fan of telling a story. Um, a number of the founders I work with will know that I, I help to, to, I generally one of the other techniques that we would have used today is storyboarding. Being able to actually tell the story of the product or service, being able to tell the story of where the business is going as a venture, where it's moving forward. I think there's also some great techniques from storytelling. The ability to actually bring you know a, a middle and a conclusion um, uh, you know to a story as a narrative being able to actually put the hero's journey and use some of the techniques from hero's journey and from writing to beats and to models about stories I, I think they're great and i think you need to work upon what the story actually is and how you tell it but try not to get the story to overtake what the purpose of the pitch might be so there, there's a slight negative sometimes that you get people carried on with the, the story aspect of what their business is, but they're weak on what the business aspect is, or they're weaker on how they, what they're going to do with the investment money. So you need to be balanced across all those points. Perfect. Thanks for that, Steve. We've got a few similar questions again with people asking if there are any questions you should expect to be asked after a pitch. Always expect the unexpected, and that's one of the advantages of doing it with as many people as you can by pitching for feedback is to help you prepare. Um, I, think, I think some great questions that generally come out are things like, what would be your first hire? You know, what, what would you do if the competition does this? Have you thought about that? You know, and that all helps you to be able to show and demonstrate to the people that you're pitching to your level of preparedness, your level of agility, your level of you know how, how flexible and responsive you're going to be to these type of things another question is okay so what i've seen all that that's great but what about the next six weeks what are you going to do in the next six weeks how are you moving this forward i'm known for saying you know entrepreneurial action beats entrepreneurial thought every day of the week what action could eric take to get this moving forward if eric came and pitched this to me i'd be saying when are you having that conversation with the next local authority when are you actually going to demonstrate this in a safe environment and prove it to people. Let's video that example. You know, so for me, it's about moving it on and being able to sort of, uh, I guess, be able to get that, that balancing piece right um, between these points. Does that, does that answer it, do you think? Yeah, that's great. Um, again, we've got a couple of people have asked a similar question about how you decide how much investment to ask for when pitching or how you value your company when pitching your idea to investors. Now that's a different question for a different day, probably, because valuation is a very big topic. And um, for me, the best way to get valuation is to get a sense of similar businesses and what the raise has been. Um, at an early stage, 
an idea that hasn't got any technology, that hasn't got a proven market, that hasn't got client traction, and you're seeking a one, two, three million pound valuation, um, you know, you've got to have a really confident and compelling process to be able to support that. Mm-hmm. Getting insight early as to how companies are valued, how potentially you could see how the others are potentially being invested into in the same space, that's always useful. Um, an alternative way is to say, um, one of the techniques I often use to people is say, right, we're going to value the company at a million. What have we got to do to value the company at a million? What's got, to, what's got to be in place? Is it going to be clients? Is it going to be technology? Is it going to be IP? What, what's going to mean that people are willing to see this as a million pound or willing to put 100,000 in for 10% or more for, 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 for bigger percentage? So, it, it, you know, it's, a, it's about getting a sense of how others will value your company is far more important than how you see the value of your company. Perfect, thanks. Um, again, another few people have asked if you'd be able to expand on cliche flipping. Cliche flipping. Um, uh, cliche flipping is a technique from sort of disruption and thinking about things from a disruption perspective. Basically, has three phases to it. So, if you want to think of a disruption, think first of all of the cliches, of the norms, of the assumptions in a market or in a sector. So, if we think about the, a coffee shop. Yeah, if we think about a coffee shop, the cliche in a coffee shop is that you sit in a chair and you drink coffee and you talk to your friends. So if we can think about how we could flip that, imagine that the coffee shop comes to you. So a portable coffee barista that turns up at your, at your, at your workplace, that could be one answer. We could imagine that you don't actually sit. Imagine no chairs in a coffee shop and it was just standing room only. Imagine that it was just, you know, a different form of of where it's a different beverage altogether. It's no longer coffee, but it's, you know, it's, it's a milkshake store as opposed to a coffee store or something. So the flip the cliche is basically just a technique to say, what's the cliches in this market sector and what would be the opposite of them? So we go back to Eric's example. The cliche was dog mess is worthless. How do we flip it? We say dog mess is valuable. How do we find out that dog mess is valuable? Or we find what else could it be converted into? In our case, energy. Does that answer that? That's great. We've got a question here from Sam who asks if you have any recommended sort of methods or environments even for practicing and receiving feedback on a pitch. I think the public speaking side of things. Um, I always advise three things. One, do it in front of friends. Um, Do it in front of people that you know. Do it in front of people who actually do review people's pitches. So maybe a few investors, maybe a few people who work in the investment community, maybe some professional advisors, lawyers, accountants, um, maybe maybe some academics. Be prepared for feedback that might not be what you want to hear. So be ready to listen to all the feedback, not necessarily for you to respond to it, but be willing to listen to it all. Um, Be thoughtful about how other people perceive it. One of the things is video. So actually, if you capture yourself on video, you'll notice your small mannerisms, you'll notice your small tells, your small ticks, and you'll be able to see whether or not you should have moved your hand 15,000 times in 10 minutes, or whether just actually putting something in your hand would have held it steady, and how that distracted people. Um, So sometimes videoing is quite useful as well. And if you've got the option, I mean, today it's a lot easier, you know, being able to get some of your video, you use an iPad or a phone, It's quite a simple technique that can help to get you some real-time feedback. Another way to do that is is also is to get somebody else to do your pitch for you and for you to watch it. So get work with another entrepreneur, you give them your pitch and get them to pitch it to another group of people and you watch it. And then you'll get to see it from a different perspective and you'll be able to ask questions from a different viewpoint. Perfect. Thanks, Steve. We have someone else who has asked how important is a patent or some other form of IP protection um, it depends very much on one, what the shape of the business is and depends very much on, you know, what you're trying to build and grow. So I am a fan of patents in the right space. Um, you know, if, it, if it's critical technology, if it's, you know, stuff that actually you feel that there's a, there's a, uh, a novel and unique methodology or technique or method scientifically, and you need to protect that. However, I'm a far bigger fan that the market is the, is the best driver of success. You know, it would be very difficult for Airbnb to have patented, you know, we're going to put an airbed on the floor and we're going to charge people money for it. 
um, and yet they've managed to raise significant chunks of money. The IP is around how they do stuff as opposed to the patented aspect of IP. And, and that's important. So you can have inte intellectual property, you can have knowledge and expertise in your company, which can be valued. It doesn't necessarily need to be patented. Perfect. Thanks, Steve. We have someone else who has asked if you could go into a bit more detail around the terms unicorn nurturing and rabbit farming. <laughs> rabbit. A rabbit is a real awesome business building interesting technology. Um, and it's a term that was coined by CB Insights uh, a couple of years ago now on the back of the piece about unicorns. Um, so unicorns, as you'll know, is a company with a billion dollar valuation or more at a valuation point. And the thing with unicorn nurturing is it's about being able to say, OK, we've got something which is big and bold. How are we going to help it to get to that next stage? In Scotland, we've had two unicorns and we're trying to help to be able to develop three, four and five behind that. Rabbit farming. There's a lot more rabbits in the real world than there are unicorns, and it's about the same. I mean, by the way, did you know the unicorn is the uh, the, the emblem of Scotland? You know, so it's a it's representative in a different way as well. But if we go back to rabbit farming, um, you know, we want to create the environment and the conditions that allow a lot more businesses, a lot more innovators, a lot more entrepreneurs to get their businesses off the ground and start to scale. And so, some of the activity that I do is about improving the ecosystem for entrepreneurs. Whereas the work with Unicorn Nurturing is working directly with the individual founders uh, of the companies that potentially could be unicorns in the future. Great. Thanks, Steve. Um, we've got a question here from Gustav who asks if you have any examples you can share of real life pitches that you've heard recently that made an impression on you. Unfortunately, everything I do is under confidence. And, and so most of the things that I see, I can't. What we will do is I'll talk to some of the entrepreneurs I work with. And when we put out some material about this, we'll put some direct links to some of their pitches or some of their video pitches for you to look at watch. Perfect. Um, we've had a few similar questions, again, asking if there are any notable faux pas or things definitely not to do during a pitch. Um, overly complex technology generally tends to go wrong. So you end up losing all the time that you had to pitch because you're trying to get your overly complex piece of technology to prove how credible you are. And all it essentially does is just end up with everybody going, OK, yeah, you can't make it work in a room with us now. How are we going to believe it's going to work in the future? So I, I always say sort of tend away from, from, from high tech pitches. Um, likewise, I find pitches that are very free form. I, I'm, 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 you know, I've seen people stand up and their opening line has been is, I'm not prepared anything for you today. I just thought we'd have a chat. And I'm just thinking instantly, you know, there's, there's a few red flags in my head about that point. Um, wild rambling technology discussions that focus just on all the technology and the science and the deep science and the deeper technology aspects and doesn't allow me to answer any questions about the market or about the business models or about operations or about competitors, that doesn't really help and, and often uh, damages credibility because people look at this and just say, yeah, it's another science venture. You know, they're seeking more grant funding or they're seeking more technology funding, actually what's needed. A good example there is go back to that data to text um, company out of University of Aberdeen, originally three data scientists, not an entrepreneur, when they, and, and they was just in that grant loop of, of chasing additional grants and being able to get new projects off the ground to put their science and technology into. Great projects, but none of them really with great commercial prospects. It was only when the entrepreneur came in that the conversation started to change, the focus started to change, and Ian did a great job at, at developing and sharpening the pitch for the business overall. Perfect. Um, on a kind of related note, we've got a question here from Chloe who asks if recent developments in technology might have some impact or effect on the way that we pitch or seek investment in the future. Um, I'll assume that that means that technology drivers in general, as opposed to technology about pitching. So, so we'll just talk first about technology about pitching and then we'll go back to technology drivers in general. So there is a lot of new new approaches. So you don't need to stand up in front of a PowerPoint any longer. There's numerous ways in which that could be done. Canva, Prezi, 
you know, live streams, there's all sorts of different techniques and methods. And yes, that technology, if it enhances across your three C's, if it enhances your credibility, encourages and improves the uh, compelling, compelling nature and establishes your credibility, you know, then uh, improves your confidence in it, then I, then I think all of that together, yes, it's great to use those new techniques and methods. Assuming that's not what the question is about, and instead it's about the driving force of, of digital and technology as a, a transformational agent for markets in all sorts of sectors and all sorts of spaces, that's the race we're all in, right? So being able to bring data-driven techniques and methods to the dentist's office, to the farm, to the shop floor in a manufacturing facility, being able to encourage people to see the business benefits of those technologies, as opposed to just the technology themselves, that's where the trick is. So it's not just about the tech. What we need to do as entrepreneurs and founders and business people is articulate clearly where the business benefits and gains are. What's the value proposition? Who's going to buy it? Why are they going to buy it? How are they going to buy it? What's it going to matter? How's it going to make them more competitive? How's it going to help them to deliver more value for their clients? Perfect. Thanks, Steve. Um, we have another question here from Marco who asks if you have any advice for getting people to listen to your pitch in the first place. Well, getting the first couple of minutes. Um, I think the key is back to that compelling nature. You know, you've got to you've got to find a way of getting that compelling aspect so that somebody's willing to spend three, four, five minutes. If you say I want an hour of their time, that's hard. If you say can I buy you coffee for five minutes, that's a lot easier. Yeah, if you say, can I find 10 minutes on a Skype call, that's a lot easier than trying to find an error in somebody's diary three cities away or, or half a continent away. You know, so I, I think the key is showing your tenacity. Often there's lots of gatekeepers, often there's lots of obstacles in the way, and they're deliberately so. Many people would like to, you know, you need to work through introducers. So you need to find somebody who has a reference, already has an established relationship, you prove your credentials to them and then they may make the introduction or open the doors for you. Great. Thanks, Steve. Um, we have another question from someone who's asked if any of this advice is any different in the case of nonprofits. I think all the technique can be used equally the same. So I think the PMI and the compelling, the credible and, uh, and confident nature, that's exactly the same for nonprofits and social enterprises. I think the difference comes as to the nature of the business shape itself. So for me, I like to call a non-profit a cause-based business, a passion-based business. And for me, the heart of its story is about what's the passion? What is it that's actually trying to achieve? Is it trying to eradicate disease? Is it trying to improve the, uh, the state of people in the slums? What, what's its purpose? You know, and if, if that purpose is articulated clearly and then we bring back out through the three C's, then that's, that's equally as applicable. Great, thank you. Um, we've got a question here from Jim who asks what level of detail you should go into on a first pitch, i.e. financial forecasts, etc. Depends who you're pitching to um, and depends very much on your confidence and your authentic voice. If you are from a financial background and the numbers are what's the passion for the business that you're in and you really get them and you really understand them and that's what you're, you can make your compelling story around, then yes, build those financials into that pitch and make sure you stress how exciting the financials of this business actually are. If, however, that's really your weak area, and it's an area where there's lots of uncertainty, there's lots of unknowns, there's lots of assumptions, then maybe that would damage your credibility. So maybe having something that alludes to that financial success in the future, maybe having something that states the level of ambition that you have is sufficient to be able to improve and, and demonstrate that compelling nature. Great, thanks, Steve. Um, we have someone else who's just asked specifically about the concept of elevator pitching and whether you could speak on that a little bit. An elevator pitch versus a pitch for me is just a pitch. So an elevator pitch, um, when I used to work in a corporate office, there was 10 floors and there was an elevator and literally we would test people. Could they get their idea down and through by the time somebody had gone from the top floor to the bottom or from the bottom floor to the top? And that's the meaning of an elevator pitch. It's can you, if you had that moment of time, can you make the most of it? So in the corporate environment, you learn how to say your story at a water cooler, in the lift, in the elevator, in the cafe area. You know, how do you get, when somebody says to you, Steve, what's, what's happening? What's going on with your project? You know, and that's a senior director. You don't want to say, oh, it's terrible. Things are falling over and I'm not getting any results and I'm having a really bad day. 
you want to say, yeah, we're rocking it, we're doing this, we're doing that, and we're going to have you know a, a 20% increase in inventory turns by the end of the week. Why didn't you come down and see the team? Yeah, so you, it's an understanding of what's fit for that purpose and how do you, how do you actually drive that through. For me, the concept of the elevator pitch is the condensing it down. So if we went back to Eric's pitch, Eric's the elevator pitch is essentially what we've given. You know, he's working with a few local authorities. He's trying to eradicate messy shoes. How is using drones to be able to do so? Do you want to learn more? Great. Thanks, Steve. Um, we have someone who has asked if you have any tips for appearing more confident while delivering a pitch. Practice, practice, practice and change. So practice as many times as you can. Keep on practicing. Encourage that you become very confident with your material and you're very comfortable with your material. But also change things and see how that response, uh, you know, what response comes back from that change. Because if you just get cemented down into the same pitch, given in the same way and the same style, and everybody says no to it, it might be that everybody says no to it because it's not as compelling as you might think it is, or you're not as credible as you might think you are, or it's not delivered as confidently as you might think it is. So that, that would be my big tip is just practice, 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 and find things and change them deliberately and see what response you get. So really precision level changes. You know, is it the style of the graphic? You'd be surprised at how often a change from clip art to professional photographs can make a big difference. Is it the style of the tone of language that's used, the modularity of your voice? You know, what is it that you use to make people excited about what you're doing versus what do you do to stand back and establish a position of authority? That's great. Thanks, Steve. Um, someone else here has asked if you can recommend any good resources for new entrepreneurs, I'm assuming books, videos, etc. Again, I think that's a really, uh, a really deep and wide topic. Um, we'll uh, make sure we put something out in the notes that go along with this. Um, the quick thing if my head would be um, anything to do with the lean startup, anything to do with Y Combinator, anything to do with Elevator in the UK, anything to do founder zoo that's a new thing that's just started just find founder zoo and follow them that's going to be massive uh blitz scale uh what's it called uh reed hoffman masters of scale podcast that's a great thing to listen to and um, there's lots we'll put some things on a on a on the documents that go out and, and people can pick up off that amazing thanks steve um we have a question from jules who's asked how can you apply this advice as a freelancer offering a service I think um, I, I think this is relevant to any form of pitch. So we've assumed that it's mostly you know people pitching ideas for investment, but I think it's equally the same if you're just sharpening up a, a value proposition. How do you ensure that that is compelling and credible and confident? And how do you how do you make sure that you're making value to the to the potential client? The PMI approach again equally applicable to to a range of different environments. Anywhere where you really need to refine and improve something, the PMI technique works really well. DAFT, we've used DAFT in all sorts of uh, market sectors and opportunities. So I think that can work quite well. Um, I think the key for me would be put your client at the heart of the story that you talk about and then help them to see how you need to be part of their journey. Great. Thanks, Steve. Um, and I think we just have one final question here from Angus who's asked, if a two-person pitch works, um, if you're working with a business partner, or should you just stick to one? No, I'm, I'm a fan of multi-voices. I think you can use that well. I think you could potentially use the, the difference between your two voices and styles to be able to give some variety and some color in that pitch. What I'm not so much a fan of is when you have two people and one person basically does all the pitching and the other person answers all the questions. I'm not such a fan of that. And I'm also not such a fan of when you have the two, but they actually cut against each other. What I did see once was actually three people pitch. And as one person started to say something, the other person who is their co-founder on this business said, I think you'll find it's not really like that. It's more like this, cutting across them. To which the other person in the threesome said, afterwards no you're wrong it's more like this now imagine there's two of us sitting there as potential investors 
do we have a red card or do we have a green flag? You know, I think at that point I was in a red card quite heavily. You know, it, it didn't show me that the team was actually gelling well. It didn't show me that they actually respected each other. You know, and they, they were more important red flags back to credibility. It had gone in an instant. Um, that's great. Thanks, Steve. We've actually just got another question that's come in while you've been answering that. Um, someone has asked, um, Shark Tank investor Mark Cuban always says that we should never sell 50% of our company. What are your views regarding this? I totally agree. Um, I always advise people to keep the controlling share. I've seen a number of founders still have the control taken away from them, even by not giving away 50% of the company. You need to be in it to win it, and you need to be in it to make the most out of it. Otherwise, if I'm investing in you, I'm feeling that actually you might not be as in it as much as you might like to be. So yes, some people give some silly valuations and some silly equity stakes, but my advice, keep things practical, keep things at a level where the next stage and the next stage beyond that, things are still manageable. It's easy and clean for investors to see how things can work out in the future. And don't make it so that actually I'm gonna be the guy owning and running this company when it's you as the founder of it. You need to stay that person. That's great. Thanks, Steve. Um, one more question that's just come in. Um, someone's asked for advice for pitching specifically. Um, if you're presenting a man to a manufacturing company for a representation opportunity to a new market. So if they're taking something to a new market, presumably. So I'm going, to, I'm going to assume that that's like a distribution opportunity. So essentially somebody else is making it and you're going to be you're going to say you could distribute that for them in a different geography or a, a different market sector. So back to the same answer as to the, the, the sort of the, um, the service environment or consultancy environment. I think you can still apply the same techniques and methods. We use those same techniques and methods in my corporate career with business development for a number of years. You know, sharpening the sales pitch um, understanding the value proposition. One of the things I would recommend would be um, the work by Ellie Goldratt um, on, uh, on distribution and understanding distribution economics and deal with constraints for, for distribution partners. Being able to get a gain share as a reseller and being able to actually open up an entire new market for a manufacturing company is, is a great one. Build, build your value proposition upon helping them to be able to get that additional sales. Um, you know, if you can link your services to to their profit, that's a great place to be. Um, oh, Isn't it obvious? obvious? That's the name of the book I was looking for. Isn't it obvious? That's a that's the that's the book. I'll put it put it out in the references. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Steve. Um, again, we've just had another question about if it's advisable to show the investors' weaknesses as well, or only focus on the good side of the venture. Going back to credibility, one way to show credibility is to actually say, you know what, there's three of us. One's a techie guy, one's a marketing guy, one's an operations guy, but we're missing a finance person and we're weak on finance and we're looking for somebody to fill that space. And when we get investment, then we'll be able to find that, you know, fund somebody to come and fill that space. Being able to demonstrate and show that is fine. It helps to show that you're serious about your business and you understand it. Um, you know, being able to show that you are aware of your weak areas and that you're doing something about them is important. Just saying you've got a weaker area and not doing anything about it doesn't establish credibility. So if you say, well, we're a techie company and we're really terrible at marketing and we need a couple of million pounds to be able to build our company, you know, you don't tell me what you get, how you're gonna use that money to be able to improve your marketing capability. You know, that, that for me gives me a red flag. Great, thanks, Steve. Well, I think that's all the questions we've got. So I think we just better wrap up. I'd just like to say thanks again to Steve for presenting the webinar today. And thanks again to everyone for joining us and for all the questions. So thanks again, and we hope everyone has a great day.